Chair, and uh, apologies to Nick Ballinger for uh, the technical uh, difficulty. So uh, uh, Nick Ballinger sent through four photographs, uh, and I'll just go through them. Photo one. <laughs> left at the end. <laughs> <laughs> right. I actually said there were one minute remaining. I don't think we've completely timed the um, the final one minute. Uh, are we okay to... Yeah, I think we did have about 15 seconds. So, yeah. As long as you can keep it to describing I'm where the vantage points are. Yeah. That's exactly it. Thank you. So this is photo one. This is taken from the direction of Scalebrook, a little bit closer. Oh, I can't speak that fast. <laughs> <laughs> that's, oh, that's the second one from the top of Hazel Lane. Um, uh, looking directly at the site. Third one, this is from Butt Lane near Hampole, overlooking the site, and in the foreground is the um, kennels. And this final one is overlooking Hampole from the A638, showing how it's overshadowed by the uh, mountain behind it. Thank you. Thank you for that. If you press your large red button. Okay, committee members, uh, would you like to ask Mr Ballinger any questions, please? Um, I'm going to start with Councillor Cox and Councillor Hogarth. In, in the land cells that have already been filled, have you ever had any smells from them? <laughs> well, where we live in Hampole, you can't tell which cell the smells come from, but as soon as the wind comes in our direction to Hampole, we get the smells, and similarly... If the wind blows towards Scalebrook, you get the smells, and likewise to, to Morehouse. And when we get smells, uh, we have to um, either ignore it or, or call the Environment Agency and report it. Um, and the last time I reported one to the Environment Agency, said, I used to report these bad smells a lot more, but I've given up because nothing ever happens. And she said to me, do you know, I don't blame you. Councillor Hogarth, if you could press your red button when you finish speaking, please, Mr Ballinger. Thank you. Yeah, in view of the significant incident of, uh, that's come to light of yesterday of uh, over-tipping, uh, have you reported the over-tipping at all? I know it's hard to know that they've over-tipped, but my opinion is that if they're going to ignore the rules currently, that will, how confident are you also in that we'll comply with them in future? Um, there have been numerous, numerous complaints over the last 10 years, I would say, of, of over-tipping. And um, one major complaint went all the way to the Ombudsman, who, um, who asked the council or the authority to apologise to the complainant because the complainant had been told in 2020, around that time, that it was not the responsibility of the authority to control the height, it was, the, it was within the responsibility of the Environment Agency. And the Environment Agency obviously said, no, that's incorrect. The height of the tip is set by the council and they have to monitor and enforce it as necessary. And as well as um, apologizing, I think uh, they ran a training course with the Environment Agency, the, the authority did, to try and clarify whose responsibility was what and what they could enforce. Um, in terms of the second part of your question, I don't think we have any confidence that um, Cat Plant will follow the rules. They're, they always seem to chance them. We had the whole Sterifiber issue where they brought Sterifiber onto site, um, constructed the fiber pad that you've seen the picture of, they held it there for several years. Uh, the problem with Sterifiber was that the smell was so much worse than even the landfill smell um, that um, there were really so, much, so many complaints. And we went through so many um, appeals and there was enforcement and so on. And I mean, thankfully, the authority stuck with it on that occasion. And and force the thing through, and there is no Sterifiber on site now. But in terms of being able to, to trust this operator, I think uh, I can't find think of anybody in any village who would, would trust them. They've not been a good neighbor, unfortunately. And, uh, and 
We've had no, absolutely no consultation over the last five years about any of these proposed condition changes. In fact, the first we found out it was going to planning committee was two weeks ago. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Uh, Councillor Mouncey. <coughs> Mr. Bellamy, you mentioned settlement uh, as a former miner. I know about settlement in Strata. What, what were you the parish council concerned about the settlement? Because I think I know where you're coming from. But have you looked at this, what they, they are offering? Is that compatible with what you say, or would you like a, a lesser reduction in the settlement height? I'm, I'm not sure I quite got all of that. Oh, sorry. By the way, your settlement, right? He discussed the settlement, the increased the settlement, as you said, right? Is the a level at which you feel at, at Tampa will be such, satisfied with in regards how much quick the settlement can be? Because settlement is sometimes longer than what the professionals say. I, th I think the settlement, uh, there's a big issue about settlement because over the last several years, the, the, the mix of the waste has changed dramatically. I mean, at one time, when, when this tip started, everybody's household waste went directly into the tip, whether it was your kitchen waste, some of your garden waste, everything went in there, and commercial waste. But now, there's virtually no um, commercial, no um, household waste from Doncaster at all um, because it all goes for recycling as we know so I think it's mainly commercial waste that there so they're going into the unknown in terms of how it's actually going to compact and this is why this as, as uh, Roy said this is why there's so much uncertainty and why the Environment Agency have said you should be exercising a lot of caution about going for a 30% reduction because if you do go for a 30% reduction and it doesn't reduce by 30%, you, it will be very, very difficult to reduce the height and we won't necessarily support it because these are engineered structures with uh, big sheets across them and gas pipes going down through them um, and therefore it would be very difficult and environmentally, I think, seen as quite costly because it will allow a lot of gases to escape that are currently being collected. So nobody knows whether 30% is going to be achieved. If you look at the graphs from older landfill sites, um, it looks like it's going to take 100 years or more, but they've got a different waste mix anyway. So there is huge uncertainty and huge complexity in this, and um, we frankly don't really want that risk to be taken because of the the impact that this mountain has on on the local villages and the surrounding landscape and indeed what we were promised when when the planning permission was first granted all those years ago 20 years ago do we have any other questions council stapleton thank you um, as you and i both know Hampol is an absolutely fantastic little village, and what many people don't know, it has a tourist industry, a very specific tourist industry, um, with vast numbers of uh, pilgrims coming from America to visit the, the site. Um, obviously, you're more local than I, and I'm, I'm sort of keen to see what, how you think that some of these changes may affect the number of visitors coming and, and their enjoyment of that site. Well, of course, what what uh, Gary's referring to here is the, the visitors that come to see the Richard Rolly Memorial and the site of the Hampole Priory. And uh, indeed, we, we do get many tourists, but they, they tend not to be too many local people. They tend to have come from a lot further afield. And I mean, it isn't a, a great backdrop, um, as I think one of the pictures that Roy showed was across the the main street, which is basically the road you go down to see the Richard Rolly Memorial. Um, so the first view they get of Hampole is the top of the landfill site staring them in the face. So, so you know, the height of it is not, um, is not great. And obviously with the exposed waste that's always there, it's not a good look. So um, 
I think you're, you're possibly right. And uh, with the smells and so on, um, it detracts uh, from from the beauty of the place. And and now, as I'm sure many of you know, that uh, the the large beech tree has been, uh, or is in the process of being chopped down in the village as we speak today, this 250 year old beech, very sadly, um, is opening up views from, from the centre of village to to the landfill site. And uh, so it's a, it's a very sad day. So anything um, that the planning committee can do to reduce the impact of this would be very gratefully received by residents, I assure you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Thank you for your time, Mr. Ballinger. Uh, we've now got Councillor Glenn Bolthwold, member for Sproprah, was requested to speak on the application. This is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes. Please press the large red button when you want to speak and again to mute the microphone uh, when you've concluded. And I'll let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Thanks very much, Chair, um, and thanks very much for Nick for speaking. Um, I think the residents of Hampall and the surrounding area have been very patient uh, and very reasonable with their requests for, for this planning application. It is a, a very historic site, the surrounding area, um, as Councillor Stapleton mentioned a few moments ago. And, and that kind of does bring me into why some of these conditions shouldn't be changed. Regarding the mud and water on the road, we would like to see that existing condition in condition 10 retained and in fact we'd like to see that increase so that we would have regular sweeping on that road it's not a very nice sight if you're a tourist coming into the area or even just a, a regular resident uh, to see all the mud on the road as you you come into the village regarding the the settlement height th this is not an exact science and i think that's been echoed by uh, what roy sykes has said and what uh, um, resident nick ballinger has said in in terms of calculating that overall settlement height as it's we don't there's not really enough data available uh, in terms of being able to calculate this and it does strike me that changing this to the 30 percent is really a, a way of of addressing the existing over tipping and trying to bring that within the the bounds of the application rather than um, having to address the existing over tipping so we would like to see the, the settlement height remain the same and for that overtipping to be addressed. Re regarding the extension of the quarry operation, the extension of two years behind the original closing date of quarrying uh, so that there would be time to address the site, that, that is suggested to be changed in here, allowing them to continue to quarry right up to 2034 and not ceasing that in 2032 um, where they would have to do the restoration of the site for two years. And then there was the issue regarding the open top lagoons. We'd like to see these to, to be covered. Obviously, the, as uh, was mentioned earlier, there was an incident nearby of somebody falling into a lagoon. And we'd like to make sure that for safety reasons that they were addressed. We have mentioned perhaps uh, capping those, uh, but we'd like to see some kind of action taken so that they were made safe in whatever uh, way that is, is required. So I think the the requirements of, of the local residents are quite reasonable for this. They just want to make it safe, make sure that it sticks to the original planning conditions. Um, and regarding the settlement height, it does seem prudent and uh, quite reasonable to continue the existing 20, 25%. And if it does end up with a, a, a gap or a, some kind of sump or reservoir uh, affecting over time, I'm, I'm sure it's easier to top up than it is to take away. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Bluff. Do we have any questions for Councillor Bluff? No? Okay, thank you. I'm now going to ask committee members if they wish to ask Councillor Bluff any questions. No? Sorry, I'll try and speak. I've got a bit of a dry, dry mouth. Um, do you have any questions for Councillor Bluff? No. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Okay, thank you very much. I'm now going to invite Mr. Chris Fallon, the agent for the applicant, uh, who is also in attendance, to answer any questions members may have. Um, is Mr. Fallon here?
Okay, just to let committee know that we haven't got Mr. Ballam down for doing any talk or anything, but he's here to answer any questions that you may have. So do any committee members have any questions for the applicant? Chair, before you start, who is he? Mr. Chris Ballam. That's his name, but who is he? He's the applicant's agent. So we're going to start with Councillor Hogarth. Uh, I don't suppose you can actually significantly overtip accidentally. So is there any reason why I decided to made the decision to deliberately overtip on what they're allowed to? As far as I'm aware, there is no overtipping. Um, you have to put things like soils up on the on the top, ready to spread. So you have to store them up there. If you put them in the quarry, there's a risk that they will be contaminated with waste or quarry fines um, affected by water and so on. So your soils that are destined for restoration have to go on the top. And that's the um, brown material that you've seen sat up on the top. Uh, that's perfectly okay according to the planning permission. I, I'm not aware that any waste has been over-tipped, except there are one or two places where they've got to fill in um, roadways and so on up the side of the tip, and it's good practice not to push it uphill. So you you place it above where you've got to fill in, and then you push it into the into the uh, void space. So as far as I'm aware, there is no over-tipping. Supplementary. Yeah, on that, then my planning, uh, senior planning officer went yesterday and uh, found the significantly over-tipped and uh, they started remedying it. So if they didn't do it, why were they remedying it? So I keep forgetting. I must apologise, my hearing isn't what it might be, despite the fact that I wear hearing aids. Um, can you repeat that again? Yesterday, our senior planning officer visited the site and there was evidence of seriously or significant over tipping, and they started remedying that situation. So, if there's no over tipping, what were they remedying? Um, I don't know, I wasn't there, but I repeat, as far as I'm aware, there is no over-tipping. There are operational reasons for everything that's done, and when the cells are completed, they will be at the approved level, um, which is allowing for 30% um, settlement, and that, incidentally, was the figure used in the 2004 permission. So. In 2004, it was allowed for 30% settlement, and it continues to be allowed for 30% settlement. That hasn't changed. Well, all that's changed is the quarry has been deepened by eight metres because the original thought on where the groundwater levels were uh, subsequently proved not to be the case. So the Environment Agency allowed the quarry to be deepened. So if you, if you allow... If, if you deepen the quarry by eight metres, you've got to add 30% to that eight, me eight metres to get back to where you were at the beginning. That's the reason why the pre-settlement is a bit higher over parts of the quarry, but not at the southern end because that wasn't deepened. Thank you for that. Just so you're aware, Charlie, if you actually come back when we go to questions to the officer, where I can clarify what he said because he did state that uh, they were having to actually move soil to, to fill in where the vehicles have been travelling. So we can get right to clarify that question for you. Um, right, I've got uh, Councillor Stapleton, then Councillor Cock, then Councillor Pickering. So we'll go to Councillor Stapleton first. Thank you, Chair. Um, one of the things that's, that, that's come to light, having listened to local residents, um, is that they knew nothing about this until the planning application. Given that there has been a long history of, shall we say, disagreement between local residents and the company. Is, is this a misunderstanding or pure contempt of the local community that you've not bothered to actually communicate with them over this? I, I, 
I've been involved with this site for the last 25 years, half my working life so far, and I wrote the 2004 permission. Back then, there was a liaison between the quarry and the um, the parish council. I, I remember, I think I went to it once, um, but it got so fractious that the, the company, um, I may be wrong in this, but it's what I think, the company decided that it was not pleasant going to it, so they stopped going. I, I should add, it was never a formal in arrangement. It was at the request of the Parish Council. Thank you. Um, I still can't... I still sort of have a bit of an issue that, that the local community knew nothing about this until a couple of weeks ago yeah, when this application came in. Uh, can I make a suggestion? It may be a condition as a planning committee that you want to fetch that, that liaison in communication. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. I was going to do that anyway. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Council Cox? Thank you. And, and same as Chair's just meant, I was going to ask Roy for clarification over, over, over tipping, but that will obviously come forward, even though we've heard it, that term mentioned several times and apparently it doesn't happen. But when when the 30%, the, the how are we going to know? I mean, obviously, the, the Roy's said that there's over tipping, that there isn't over tipping, we'll get that clarity. But if it doesn't get 30%, is it, well, we never said that in the first place. If, how is that going to be measured? And plus, I'd like to know when the, the report was done with the EA about the water table levels, what time of year was that? Um, <clears throat> the 30% figure, as I said, uh, was used in 2004 for the original planning permission and in general that hasn't been changed with this type of landfill some have come in a bit been allowed to uh, go down to 25 percent but a lot remain at the 30 percent level and the answer is we don't know what it'll be like in a hundred years time the settlement um, should largely be over in about 60 years, but it will carry on incrementally after that. Um, and I think the key point is the difference between 30% and 25% is about six feet. Um, so in terms of its impact on the landscape, it, it's negligible. And the, the perimeter of the landfill is going to be tree planted. So the trees, you know, could be... 30, 40, 50 feet high, so a difference of six feet, two meters, isn't going to make very much difference in the in the general landscape. Could could you tell me when the work were done with the EA to look at the where the water table was? What time of year? It it was based on um, boreholes being drilled and monitored for over 12 months I think it was and it's a continual process it's still looking at it so the borehole the water levels in the borehole have been monitored for the past 22 23 years and that information has to go to the environment agency all the time Councillor Pickering uh, yeah just one, one uh uh, could, could you tell us, you, you mentioned that the 30% uh, uh, figure was originally uh, accepted uh, in 2004, um, but obviously that's 20, 20 years ago now. Were, were the same materials being tipped in 2004 that it, uh, as, as are being proposed now? I may be wrong, I can't remember Doncaster's waste, been waste going into the quarry. Um, yeah, I think that stopped a long, long time ago. Um, I, I must admit, I'm surprised when I go in there and I see what's coming out of wagons. There's a lot of uh, paper, there's a lot of board, there's a, all sorts of things, wood and so on. And all of that is biodegradable and it will break down. 
Um, and what's happened is that as time has gone on and the uh, recycling is increased, the number of landfills has fallen quite dramatically and Hazel Lane is one of the last in the general area um, for about 30 or 40 miles. Um, so when Hazel Lane closes, I don't know when we're, when you're going to put your, your waste that you can't recycle. Um, so the, the nature of the waste has changed a little bit, but it, it, as far as the Environment Agency is concerned, they're quite happy with the 30% um, settlement rate. Do we have any other questions for Mr. Bellum? Okay, thank you for your time. Um, committee members, it's now going into debate, uh, so does any member wish to make a comment on the report or ask the planning case officer uh, a question? And from the smile of Mr. Stapleton's face, I think Councillor Stapleton would like to ask a question. Of course I would, Chair. Um, I think I know the answer to this, Mr. Sykes, but I'm going to ask it anyway, just for clarity. So, <clears throat> on page 44, 811 Ecology, it goes on page 44, and it's a complete list of things to undertake. Are you with me? Am I right in believing that these have been undertaken, and that was the the document that, that was um, that the ecologist refers to in the, the first part? So in other words, that the, those reports there have actually been undertaken and submitted as part of the ecology report? Yes. Thank you. That's all I wanted to know. Uh, Councillor Cop. Thank you. Um, can you clarify, please, over tipping, Sir Roy? settlement levels. Thank you. Uh, I'll repeat that. Mr. Ballam is, is right in that on the planning permission there is only a stipulation in relation to pre and post settlement levels. There is nothing that says that you can't over tip. However, what's also been mentioned is correct is that the material on the top of the site is above what is proposed to be the pre settlement levels as revised. So, so there is over-tipping on the site, but what Mr. Ballam was, was saying, which is correct from my understanding, is that that material that you can see on this photo, let me zoom in one for you, that material has been brought up to the site, that waste material to the top, that is over-tipped above the 74 metres that is being proposed, but that material now is going to be pushed into the quarry, this is coming into the quarry, because there is a whole road leading up to the top of the quarry. That whole road is no longer needed because there is now a new whole road further down the quarry as the landfilling has, has ex extended. So they are now closing this void and that is a significant void, that whole road. So that material will effectively be reduced quite significantly. And as I was saying to the right of this picture, you can see the compactor which is in the middle right of the picture, that's rolling the levels and it's not gonna be much higher because you're gonna have to form the waste levels, then there's gonna have to be a, a teram layer put over the top of it, and then there's gonna be soil on top of it to then achieve your agricultural uh, restoration, but it's not gonna be much higher than that, uh, that uh, compactor machine there. That is my understanding from the site visit yesterday. So that, bulk there is going to be pushed into the quarry and that will be reduced. So it is over tipping. Uh, supplementary for Councillor Cox and Councillor Mansell. Mm. Yeah. Um, gas, we've seen gas heads on, on the pictures. 
and I believe it will mention that they they are going to feed in or do feed into grid. Where does that feed in? Where where does the energy that that's made from this gas feed actually in, into the grid, and how does that work? I don't know exactly where it feeds into the grid, but in the bottom of the quarry, there is a landfill gas engine, big bit of kit, caboodle with exhausts and so forth, and all these pipe works will come into the bottom of the quarry, into the gas engine, where it will be converted into electricity, where it will be exported to the grid. I don't know where that is. I couldn't advise you, I'm afraid, where it is tapped into the grid. Councillor Mounsey. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want some clarification here, because when I first read this report, uh, it mentions a lot. Uh, MPA, it's the Mineral Planning Authorities. I'm assuming we are one of those, is that correct? Uh, if that's the case, with Mineral Planning Authorities, if we put in uh, conditions that are detrimental to the applicant, we could have to pay some funding. Is that right, somebody there? That's the first question. Yeah, that's correct. Can I? Right. Uh, I'm just to, just to respond to you. Possibly? Sorry, I'm just waiting for you to turn yeah. the microphone off for your first question, councillor. Thank you. Uh, Mineral planning authority, local planning authority, interchangeable. General rule of thumb, if we're dealing with a mineral site, we become the mineral planning authority. For If you're building houses or warehouses, we are just the local planning authority, but we are the mineral planning authority for this area. The point that I was mentioning earlier is that if we, as the mineral planning authority, impose via conditions any restriction on the asset value of the site, then we are liable to pay compensation to the landowner due to the loss of that asset value. That would require quite a bit of kind of uh, financial kind of uh, interrogation, surveying. There'll be a, bit, a, lot of, a lot of to in and fro in, but effectively, I think the main issue here would be is if we were trying to say, there shall be no further quarrying on this site. That would directly impact the asset value of this site. So uh, it's just to be wary of that. Thank you for that, Roy. The next question, Chair, yeah, there's, there's a follow up straight away after this. If you turn to page 59 to, 50 to 88, uh, it's appendix one. Uh, continuous yeah, con conditions on the schedule. Look at the schedule as I've read it. Is there any cost to the City of Doncaster Council if MPA is applied on there? And these modified plans, does the applicant agree to these? Sorry, Councillor, which condition are you talking about on the... Uh... Well, where it says condition schedule. And it goes on to say a lot there regarding MPA. Does it, does it qualify? But the modifying plans that may be mentioned on those pages, does the applicant agree with those modified plans? Uh, yes. Uh, all those conditions in Appendix 1 yeah. under the column MPA comment and proposed conditions have been agreed with the applicant. Uh, therefore, it is, and we are, uh, we are working on the agreement that there is no impact on the asset value of the resource okay. and therefore there will be no compensation liable. The, the next one has been picked up by some of my colleagues here. I have to follow up from that there. When you look at um, pages 89 to 99, this is the proposed conditions consolidated for ROMP decision notice. Are these agreed by the applicant? And if so, do the, what's agreed in there, does, this is important, this part, does this cover the parish council's concerns, also the archaeology concerns as agreed, or is it different to what the parish council said and the public, also the archaeological concerns there? Because this is the point I want to raise before I, Help me make my decisions here. Thank you. 
those conditions are agreed, those conditions have effectively been pulled out of that table and just consolidated into an easy referable document for the planning committee and have also had the reasons put on to the conditions as well. The, the column uh, doesn't have the reasons, this is just pulling those out. They are agreed. I would have to answer your question as to say, no, those won't address the local residents' concerns because, uh, for example, condition two talks about the pre-settlement contours. They are the pre-settlement contours up to 74 metres over the highest part of the site, which the local residents are concerned about because of the concern about, is it going to settle 30%? Is it going to settle 25%? is it going to settle 20%? So to answer you quite bluntly, councillor, I don't think you could say that the local, not that I want to speak on behalf of the local residents, but just by virtue of the proposed pre-settlement contours being in contention, I think there is disagreement there. All I would do to uh, provide a bit further uh, guidance on that is that a professional environmental company specialising in landfill cell settlement rates, serious environmental, have produced a technical document to supplement their application, the application with the evidence on settlement. And as much as there might be concern uh, that we won't achieve a 30% settlement rate, we have got no evidence as a mineral planning authority to say that we won't get there. So and we've also had a response from the Environment Agency saying you should deal with it through caution, but they do not wish to raise an objection to the levels that have been put forward in terms of settlement. So on balance, we are therefore saying that the evidence is done by a reputable company. We don't, it's not an exact science, but the Environment Agency have advised us that they are not objecting, we don't have anything that we can counter the applicant with, and therefore we are saying that we think it will go anywhere between 20 to 30%. And the important point, as Mr. Ballam mentioned earlier, 5% difference is, is on the ground, anywhere between one and a half to two meters difference. So even if it was if it was to settle at 25%, it would be two, one and a half to two metres higher. And if it was to settle to 20%, it would be three to uh, four metres higher. And over the landscape, with tree planting on the flanks, with the site being grassed up, we deem that that wouldn't result in a harmful landscape and visual impact. I apologise for the length of the answer, Councillor. <laughs> no problems yeah you, my last my last question is yet yeah, this one uh i always look when it says a, a local plan when you talk about a local plan in my opinion you want to contact and talk to as many local people as possible to get their views and their opinions and there's one or two people saying here that the consultation has been for whatever reason both sides it hasn't been fully done but the other thing is this, in my time as a councillor, before that negotiating other things, I can get consultants to come and tell me what I want. I'll show up chair, thank you. Councillor Cox. Thank you, Chair. Um, condition 37, Roy, could you just give clarity on that one, please? Because obviously it, it says in what's agreed that the, the gas, the environment the environment permit shall remove from be removed from site within 12 months obviously of, of the site closing from materials being taken out plant being moved etc yeah. we also have heard that the gas would still be being produced so does that come at a cost for us as the authority to maintain and manage or is that still something that would be on the, the land owner's premise to, to look at? And secondly, can you just tell me how close the bathhouse is to the excavations that's quarried, please? Thank you. Uh, 
once the landfill site has been completed and the site has been restored, it will be entering into an aftercare period to ensure that the trees grow for five years, the grass is maintained, the hedgerows are maintained and so on. There is also separate to planning the Environment Agency permitting regime which governs landfill sites. So the landfill site will be closed, done, but there is an ongoing requirement to deal with the leachate, to deal with the gas, uh, and uh, the Environment Agency will not allow the, uh, the applicant, cat plant, to just simply walk away from the site. They've got all the landfill, they've got all the mineral from the site. Thank you very much, I'm, I'm, I've had enough now. There is an ongoing requirement as part of the Environment Agency permit to monitor this. Uh, a time will come when that site, that landfill site, and it may take 10, another 10, 15 years, something like that, where gas starts to drop off and drop off and is no longer being generated. It then no longer is a requirement to have a gas engine on the site to turn that gas as a renewable form of energy into electricity. And it's at that point where you would be saying that all that machinery then can start coming off the site. But until that gas runs out, until uh, you know the leachate stops being produced, there's a need for all this infrastructure to, to be kept on site. But what you will see in practicality at the end of the landfilling phase will be there'll be there'll be uh, there's like storage sheds on the site. There'll be cabins and there'll be stuff like that. That's no longer needed. That can be removed. Although there might be a base required for just a little, you know, a, a small scale operation to ensure the site has security. Archaeology, uh, I will just first of all uh, premise that uh, I was the archaeologist involved at the time when this bathhouse was found and I secured its in situ preservation, much to the, the, the disgust of the applicant at the time. But, and it was a hard, hard fought battle, but they did ultimately agree. Through, through discussion to retain that in situ, uh, which I have to say was a really good uh, uh, outcome uh, through collaborative working with the applicant uh, on, on that. Uh, uh, in terms of where the bathhouse is, uh, probably if you wanna see where the excavations are. Right, okay, I'm gonna flip between two. Can you see that pink? Uh, pillar and then can you see that pink splodge yeah. that pink splodge is the bathhouse uh, and then if I come back to there can you see where the arrow is pointing to preserve Roman bathhouse that's the pillar and that's roughly pointing to where the splodge is so that's where the bathhouse is retained on the original ground, ground surface the landfill site is going to be uh, raised to a high level, to 74 metres at the bottom, 72 metres at the top, but then through settlement it will come to about 61 metres either side, which will be just two metres higher than the bathhouse uh, there, and then hopefully that's where you've achieved some kind of relationship. It, it will, the, sorry, Roy, the question was really how, how close did the excavations of quarrying get to the bathhouse site? Are we talking feet, miles, yards, but I don't know. You're talking several metres, uh, I would say, off the top of my head, it would have been 20 metres, 30 metres. It's a significant standoff, and then it's battered down from those. But it's not just a sheer drop, and it will just push over. Uh, it is battered down and is safe. Councillor Stapleton. Thank you, Chair. Roy, Roy, Roy. I remember something in the last 10 minutes. The conversation you and I had a while back about, um, and there is a point to this chair, um, about your passion for these sort of mineral applications that you have. <laughs> exactly. And how passionate you've been. I don't share the same feelings towards this. However, it's fairly obvious from this document, a lot of work's been put into it, and it's also fairly obvious that a lot of these contentious issues are unable to be challenged really by this committee because there's no grounds. However, I've got grave concerns about the process and I'm a big believer in people, process and product. Obviously the product is going to be a satisfactory um, landfill. That's the end product. 
but then the people are obviously the applicants themselves and also the people that live in the local community they're important but where I think it's the fault is lying with the process of this because when I'm reading through this quite a lot of the ask that's coming from the local community is about that process of getting to the end product they don't want to spend the next 15 20 years living with the roads covered in mud they're asking for a road sweeper rather than a so they're asking for small little things as, as part of the process. And I don't think that's unreasonable. I also am very concerned that there, was, that there has been a breakdown between the people, the process and the people, between the company and the local community. And I think there potentially is a, an option here if for both parties to agree. And whilst I accept what the, the applicants were saying about things that broke down, the one advantage that the local community have is their parish council that could facilitate meetings in an orderly fashion. And anybody that decides to disrupt it could be asked to leave by the chair. So it, it could facilitate um, that, that meeting of, of the two parties to discuss moving forward. So it, to that end, I'd, I'd like to propose that we don't vote on this today. We go away with an idea of trying to get the two parties, as in the local community and the applicant, to agree to some sort of, of compromise as far as further communication um, on the processes of how this is going to be done. Uh, and maybe they could even agree something prior to us being asked to look at it again. So the, 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 the applicant may well agree to remove the water bowsers because if from what I'm hearing, if the local community only knew about this two weeks ago, the applicants probably aren't aware that there's an issue with these sort of things. So this would give an opportunity to, for, for that to happen. So I'm going to propose that we defer this um, to give the applicants and the community an opportunity to get together and communicate. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just, uh, I suppose, one thing for members to be aware of, and just in response to Councillor Stapleton, uh, I have recently just dealt with another mineral review, uh, which is out on Hatfield Moors. Uh, so what I did as part of that mineral review, it wasn't one that had to be brought to planning committee, uh, and that's because there was a, a, a agreement between the applicant uh, and also the local community and the learned uh, bodies that are out there doing research and so on uh, on the moors. And one thing we did as part of that permission, and this would be within your gift and would uh, uh, potentially avoid a deferral, would be to impose a condition, uh, which is what we did on the Hatfield Moors uh, Mineral Review, which would be to ensure that a, a forum, a liaison forum, is formally established that would involve the parish council, the applicant, relevant officers of the council because moving forwards this will involve planning it would involve highways it would involve ecology it would involve archaeologists and i too having heard the representations today share the concern also from experience that there has been a breakdown between the local residents uh, and the operator at this site and it's not healthy it's not it's not good for community relations you know the community i do share their concerns they they have to live with this day in day out i don't uh, and they are probably always wondering what's happening next and i think just by opening up those channels of communication and formalizing that into the planning decision would be potentially a really good approach uh, and uh, importantly that wouldn't affect the asset value of the mineral site and as such we wouldn't be liable to compensation so that would be a, com a condition that we could look to impose without the need to defer and prolong this any further forward mm -hmm. that is an option for you to consider thank, thank you, you chair you. Yeah, well i'm talking now councillor mountley <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah it, it, i think what's important here is as i said people in process what's important is we've all these people sitting at the back here that live locally one or two i know They've not had the voice, and that's my concern. They've not had a voice. If only we'd, this has only been two weeks, et cetera, et cetera. And they shouldn't even have to have a voice here, like you saying. It should be that that, that should have been in, in place already. And it's a shame it has broken down. For whatever reason, we're not, I'm not here to judge that. Um, 
and like you say, it could be a good idea to put that as part of the planning application. So that, that my only concern is how is that enforceable if the if the applicant turns around and said, I don't care, we're not going, we're not going to turn up, then the whole thing was a waste of time. And the thing is, it's all right, we can give a voice to these people, and that's what all councillors do. We give voice to the people we represent. The problem is, is when that voice is completely ignored and you're shouting in an empty room, uh, after a while it just becomes frustrating as hell. And that's where I can see potentially why over the years it's broken down. So I, I, I think I would allow my learned colleagues to vote on whether they want an amendment to, or whether we go out. I'm happy to support either, but I don't think it, it, it's just for me to make a decision. I'm minded uh, to take on board what Roy said. I think rather than defer to put a condition, but also to add a condition that condition 10 be reinstated to make sure that there's the regular road sweeping in place to protect the residents um, from the... Sorry, I'm just saying that maybe that rather than a defer for the conditions to um, impose what Roy stated about the liaison group, but also condition 10 to make sure that the roads are swept regularly to keep the dust and mud down uh, would need to be taken into consideration. Uh, so for me, that's what we would need to do. I don't know where we would be regarding, it was mentioned about the, the lagoons being covered. So what would people's thoughts be regarding the lagoons? <laughs> Councillor Mouse, do you want to say something? Sorry. You need to, sorry. <laughs> You'll probably get that for the consultant, but we'll need to get the, head, the people together, first of all, to see what they want and how they want to do it. That's the, that's the start of it. Like my colleague here said, it's about getting people together, and the only way you resolve it is by talking and negotiating, and that's the way you do it. That's what you should be doing. It should have been done before this, by the way, but it's, let's do it now. Better late than never. Uh, right, we're, we're obviously, through the report that we've received, we've been made aware of what the issues are that residents have raised. We've also had uh, speakers here today that have raised certain concerns. We are able, therefore, in my opinion, to make a decision based on that information and to put additional conditions in to address those concerns, which for me would be about the liaison group to make sure that communications are open. And again, the reinstatement of condition 10 to make sure that the, uh, the muck and dust is addressed. And so for me personally, I think as a planning committee, um, should we be minded to move the application? We should do it with uh, additional conditions. Uh, I'm going to go to Councillor Cox and Councillor Pickering. Thank you, Chair. I'd, I'd be supportive of that. But what, what we've seen is with di some different liaison committees, it ends up with the developer or whoever is telling people what they're doing. The Obviously, that would come within terms and conditions. I was just going to ask whether that cross-working could be within those terms and conditions, please. Yeah, so I've been looking at some condition wording that I think we could impose. So I think we could impose something along the lines of um, prior to commencement or within a certain date after this um, permission that the operator has to come up with a scheme for the establishment of a liaison group to include the members of the local residents that Roy's mentioned, the council, the parish council and the operator and also to include um, terms of reference if you like to appoint a chairperson to appoint um, certain people from the local residents and and also to have a sort of voting procedure and so on and just I, th I think we can do something with the wording which sets out how, how the procedural elements of the meeting should be run to avoid any issues about disagreements or whatever so I think we can work with wording like that. May I just what what the 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 liaison consultative committees however we want to put them the the ones that i've been involved in it ends up with the person that is has the development you can the, they would come to you and they will tell you you then have no feed into how it's changed you you just have you they would come to you and say right we are doing this sometimes after they've done it, but there's, 
you can you can have a voice. You can say, yeah, I don't like that. But there's nothing that holds them to account. They've already done it, or they are going to do it. In that process, I think there should be something within the terms and conditions that I'm not saying necessarily holds the developer up, line and sinker, but it's got to be listened to on a fair balance. And if that action is deemed to be right by the council over the developer, then that can be followed through. Do you understand what I mean? It's, it ends up being something that's not just a let's do this because it's nice. It's a let's do this because it can work and it can build community. I'm just going to fetch Ryan before I fetch Councillor Cooper in, Ryan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I think I have to be absolutely clear with you. I don't think it would be a, a liaison meeting for the likes of local residents, the parish council, ward members, I would imagine, would be included in that as well, and relevant officers to instruct the landfill operator how to carry out uh, operations within their site. I, I see it more as opening up the communication channels and making uh, local residents, the parish council, ward members, officers, more aware of what is programmed within the coming 12 months, for example, and then discussions can take place between that, but it absolutely cannot be that we have, uh, when I say we, the other parties, apart from the applicant or the landfill operator, would be instructing them on how to carry out operations on their site because they are trained, they are qualified minerals and landfill operators on the site. So I, th I think we can work within that condition to make it clear, but I just wanted you to be clear on that. And also, just in relation to condition 10, Chair, if I can just... Uh, you talk about tightening up that condition. Uh, it's currently written that it's to just address uh, wheels, uh, go through the wheel cleaning facilities, and that uh, wheels need to be clean, and we've watered down the chassis uh, and so on. We could quite happily uh, or easily bring forward the bulk of that condition into a revised condition to make it tighter. But the one thing our, I know our highways colleagues would be very concerned about would be saying anything prescriptive that they need to put a sweeper on the road because no sweeper should be doing sweeping on the road unless it's a Doncaster, a CDC licensed sweeper. And the reason being, if a sweeper's needed, something's wrong with the operation of the site. Prevention is better than cure. So we would want to ensure that the condition is tightened. If there is an issue we need to know what that issue is. Are they using the wheel wash? Are they not? And only as a last resort is wheel washing some uh, wheel road cleansing uh, a, a pr process that needs to be considered. But that means something's failed. Thank you for that, right, Councillor Pickering? Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I'm in complete agreement that, w that they really do need to be talking to each other. And condition 10 seems a fairly easy fix for that, I think that seems a fairly easy fix. But what I'm concerned about is if we pass the application, what happens to the sort of, I would say, the, the bigger uh, picture question of this 30% 30, 30 settlement figure? How will that be resolved in negotiation if we pass it as it is? To, to be clear, the decision today would be set in those levels. There's no negotiation. That's 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 what they're working to. What I, what we've tried to advise committee is there is concern from the local community. There's concern by the environment agency. There's concern by officers. But we don't have anything to say evidentially that it will not settle at 30%. What has been put forward is a case to say that it may settle up to 30% could be 25, might even be 20. And over the landscape, that is a difference of one and a half to two metres per five percent. And we are advising you that that's been assessed and that isn't deemed to be harmful, especially when the site starts to be greened up, tree planted, etc. So, but to be clear, in granting this, you, you are also issuing the consent for the contours I see the liaison meeting being, for example, what we've discussed today, and this is just me thinking aloud, if there is a need for some operational requirement to do a bit of temporary overtipping on top of those contours, like we've seen on like we've no, like we've seen like like we've seen on the photographs, 
that that is discussed before it is even done in a liaison meeting where the local residents can make their voice absolutely clear they don't want that or the applicant, the landowner can be saying, I'm going to do this, it's only going to be for this long, with this far away, I've considered the impact, I think it'd be minimal and it can be discussed. The, the starting point for us is that we, we would be concerned about any potential over tipping on that site. I think we just need to be clear about what is programmed for the coming year by the operator to open up knowledge is power. I think people need to understand what is going to happen rather than when something has happened to them because that makes you feel disenfranchised. Councillor Pickering. Just, just go back on that. The Environment Agency really, really did uh, check it out of this one, didn't they? The Environment Agency see response just for every other members i'll just read it it's not long uh and no it didn't help uh our landfill team have reviewed the submitted information and have the following comments to make having visited the site in january with the planning authority the operator and their consultants it was agreed that further information and photographs of the current position a representation of 35 percent and 25 percent settlement rates for visualization would be provided I have viewed these documents and photographs and in the circumstances and balancing of options have insufficient reason to fully object to the proposal. It should however be noted that as previously stated, the issue of waste settlement rates and timescales remains a complex matter. And we still advise caution over approving the reduction. This caution in particular relates to the difficulty of uh, Doncaster enforcing any potential breach in planning conditions, especially where engineered capping and landfill infrastructure is in place. As we have previously stated, where possible, the need for subsequent infrastructure remediation work should be avoided, i.e. digging up the site, in order to reduce the environmental impact and issues occurring. So they didn't help, but they haven't given us anything to say that isn't going to happen. We've modelled those settlement rates, and we, as your officers, advising you on balance, are saying that a difference between 30 and 25% at the landscape level, subject to the uh, restoration being completed and tree planted, isn't deemed to be harmful. Thank you. Councillor Cox. Right. Thank you. And, and, and I mean that. Thank you, because you, you, you found this quite tricky. But absolutely, thank you very much. Do we have any other question or comments uh, that need to make? Therefore, um, I'm going to move we approve the scheme with additional conditions, which are to strengthen and tighten condition 10, and for also for an appropriate liaison committee to be sent up, set up uh, to make sure that communication is open between the residents of Parish Council, DNBC, and the applicant and any other bodies deemed necessary to input into that. Uh, that's what I put forward. Uh, do we have a seconder for that motion? That's been seconded by Councillor Cox. Do we have a show of hands in favour of that recommendation? Can you make sure your hands are showing? Councillor Cox, you seconded the motion. Are you? Well, yeah. Okay, so make sure your hands are clear. Have you got that? Anyone against? Any abstentions? Therefore, it has been approved with the additional conditions. So thank you very much, everybody, for your input. It's been a good debate. Thank you.
Can I ask anybody who is now leaving the meeting if they could leave quietly so we can then resume the meeting, please? Councillor Bluff. Can we just ask if people are leaving the room? They can do so now so we can carry on the meeting. Thank you. Item six, to seek authority to amend the approved scheme of delegation in regard to minor technical departure application. I'm going to pass this to Roy as head of planning to introduce this item. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, this, this report seeks approval from the planning committee to endorse the recommendation below, which is to remove the need in the interest of dealing with planning applications more expedi expeditiously uh, for considering minor technical departures from the development plan. So currently the scheme of delegation for planning application determinations is found at Appendix 1 in this report. Uh, and one of the triggers for planning committee is to consider certain planning applications where a proposal is deemed to constitute a departure from the development plan. This is where it's contrary to the provisions of the adopted plan. Whilst the vast majority of departure applications rightly and do come to planning committee, there have been some examples of minor technical departures which have been brought to planning committee where there has been little, if any, debate and indeed there has been uh, concern raised by some members as to why those applications have uh, even been before them. An example of that is given at paragraph 8 of your report which was for a Yorkshire Water sequential batch reactor motor control centre kiosk uh, which is within a large Yorkshire water compound site although it's washed over by Greenbelt so what was before the planning committee was basically a small box cabin uh, in a compound but we had to bring it because it was a technical departure to be clear we're not proposing to, to remove the need for all departures to come before planning committee indeed you need to be dealing with those applications because they are contrary to the development plan. These are just for the minor technical departures. So what is proposed is an alteration, an amendment to, if you look at Appendix uh, 1, uh, so uh, it's the second paragraph there. The application will be contrary to the provisions of the adopted development plan, including the Council's own supplementary planning guidance and supplementary planning documents or any other relevant guidance with the adder, the rider, except for the determination of minor technical departures and following agreement between the head of planning and the chair and or vice chair of the planning committee. Uh, now, you may want to consider some aspects uh, uh, about that, but that is what is proposed. That will remove the need for those kind of applications to be dealt with uh, which do take time to bring to a planning committee and shouldn't be touching the sides really. Uh, so the options before you are as recommended, amend, or two, leave it as it is, uh, which is not re recommended. Thank you, Chair. Right, I'm going to start with Councillor Hogarth and Councillor Cox and Councillor Stapleton. Yeah, uh, I would like to amend it slightly to include all uses of this uh, be reported at a, you know, future planning meeting. You know, is it just as a bit. Uh, absolutely no problem with that, Councillor Hogarth. So we would propose that any applications that are determined using this mechanism, if it is agreed by the planning committee, will be reported to a future planning committee as soon as practically possible. So you are informed of that. Councillor Cox? Um, my, my comment would be, I agree with Charles, but my comment would also be that can we have vice chair, uh, sorry, chair and vice chair or a another? So obviously that decision isn't just down to the chair as respected as you are, chair, but also that there's more than two people making that decision. Does that make sense? Yeah, for them to stand up. Right, I'm going to ask. Uh, Councillor Stapleton, and then we can have a discussion around it. Councillor Stapleton. 
I think my comments aren't really relevant anymore. I've just thinking, you know, why is this coming for us to discuss? <laughs> <laughs> just get on with it. I know, but just get on with it. I, I just don't see it as, to me, it's a no-brainer. Yes, but I do agree with my colleagues. There are little tweaks to it. But at the end of the day, I support Let's just get on with it. I've got places to go. Therefore, the discussion is about an, another yeah. being on there other than chair and vice chair. Uh, how would you want to decide that person who that representative would be? I'll do it. Can I make a suggestion? Uh, uh, Councillor Algar's got his hand up. Yeah. Is that an interest for you to do it as well? No, Councilor can Gar I suggest that it's, if the vice chair or chair is not available, the other person being, if possible, who's warding it? Mm. Okay. It right. Can I, can I suggest, we do have some missing today, why don't we actually email out for those that want to do it? Uh, Councillor Cox has put forward he would like to do it. And we'll, we'll take it to the next um, pre-committee meeting uh, to have a discussion. And then we may have to do a little vote. But uh, I'm, I'd be happy for Councillor Cox to do it. I don't have a problem with that at all. If, if, uh, if members in the room are happy with uh, yeah, Can I, we, we, can we, I put forward a motion that Councillor Cox is nominated it, it by the rest be, of the committee to do yeah, it? All those in favour? A majority yeah. want it. Are we all Carried. happy then for Councillor Cox? Can we have your hands up in there so we can see quite clearly, please? Okay, so therefore the amendments would be. And just future proofing this as well, <laughs> because at some point in the. Yeah, and that, um, and that the reports. <laughs> oh. not, not on record, obviously, I the other amendment is that that uh, you will be provided at the next as soon as possible meeting uh, the update of any delegated decision that's been made. Yeah. So are we all happy and agreed that that will take place? Show of hands, all in favour? Fantastic. Thank Does he get you. any money for it? <laughs> Item seven: appeal decision. It's a report for information only. Does any member wish to speak on this item, Council Cox? Sorry, sorry, oh God! <laughs> it, it's it's on the second the, the second of the appeals, and it's it's partly the reason why I asked how far the the distance was from the bathhouse to the scheduled monument site, and it's about a site. Um, if, if members have read it, it's about a site that is in our ward. It it is it was once a a site of, of significant interest. I know the site very well because I have been there and metal detected on it. What I cannot get my head around here is a lot of this information that has been put into this report to, to not allow this is old information. It is really old information and it's come from the first time, it, it's, this is not the first time it's been appealed. So the, the conclusion is the same as the first time it was appealed. Plus, may I draw your attention to other houses that are being built alongside the entrance to this site. There are two properties, quite large, being built just to the side of the entrance. And they've obviously got permission, well, I'm assuming they have, and yet this, this, these other properties that are more than 20 metres away from the site have been told that they can't. So I, I'm just seeking a bit of clarity here because it, I know the site. Poor old Mr Telly is sadly passed away. He was suffering with cancer. He's no longer with us. Um, and I, it, it loses me. I saw a lot of the information that he was putting in. Obviously, it didn't comment on it at the time, but I'm, I am I'm really really confused. I mean, the the, the I know that the Fars Road were brought into it, where Fars we know that there was a section that that potentially could have gone across across his land, but never did. We know that the the site it it 
it needed further export it needed looking at a lot more some trenches were put in trenches had been put in and they they had found nothing so the site as well had been used for various different reasons diff different uses over time one of them being a car park one of them storing materials for council for road surfacing and i'm, I'm just I'm, I'm really confused by it so if, if i could give, get some clarity i'd be really happy I, I won't be able to give you that clarity today without actually drilling into it i do recall this at the time and I think there was a lot of information that was submitted late or at the appeal stage and the inspector was basically advising, I am not going to be entertaining new information uh, because that wasn't before the council at the time. So it may be that that information is there that would update the outdated nature of the information we've got and that might change the situation. I recall there were a number of issues with this and it was lacking information. So it's not a no, well it is, the, appeal, the inspector has said it's dismissed, but it's saying, but with further information in the future, then that might be a different outcome. But I can, I can look into that and we can take that offline, councillor, if needs be. Yeah, so it was one of my former employees, uh, staff members' applications. Um, there was a number of reasons why it was refused. Yes, there was archaeological things going back and forth and some ecological as well. But the only reason for refusal that wasn't upheld was the public right of way because the inspector deemed that the design at Reserve Matters stage could overcome that concern. Uh, it is countryside policy area. That is the, so the principle isn't there to start at the very start and everything else could potentially be overcome with further information. But the, the basis is it's countryside policy area, no new houses in the countryside. And that's the policy. When the, the, the parcel of land that Mr. Telly wished to build on, sadly he can't, he's dead, but the parcel of land he wished to build on was on a concrete slab. There was a concrete slab under there that, that used to, I believe they used to make things during war on that section. So he's, he was wanting to build properties on an, where an existing concrete slab is and Yes, the, the footpath that goes from there and goes through Wakefield Lakes, side at Wildlife Park, is a public footpath. It absolutely is. And he didn't want to change that. He wanted it as a fo public footpath. I believe that some, some things on there were about seeing the traffic, about Splazing Road. You'll know from visiting that site that there's a, it, it pulls in. It used to be a bus terminus. So the entrance comes out into a, a junction that you can see very, very well on both sides, that just over that little bridge used to be the entrance to Wildlife Park. So th there are lots of things that I find very, very confusing. Uh, yeah, and I know the site well. We visited it. So it was the planning inspector. Um, he agreed with our highways department and the South Yorkshire Archaeological Service, our ecologist, um, and as you are probably aware, you know, it's not only spatial, but it's visual, it's both. So it would have had a greater impact on the countryside. And the policy 25 doesn't allow for it. Um, it's the same old catch all of as soon as a building's been demolished, it's gone. So if there was any buildings on there that was then gone, they can't be factored into footprint or additional footprint too. Um, so I personally think the right decision was made um, as the person that signed off the application. <laughs> and in the first instance, yes, there could have been some matters overcome, uh, but it was a very slow process of an application. Everything was done via post and that then automatically leads to cross wires of, well, that never arrived to us. We had to issue it within the time frames of the agreed extensions of time, but they could look at resubmitting, but the be all and end all is that it's still countryside policy area. Well, the I think new landowner. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, a decision being made, an inspector's made a decision that's beyond our control. We may never fully understand or appreciate how they come to the decisions that they do, no matter what they are, uh, but there's very little we can do about it. Are there any other concerns that anybody would like to raise or questions they'd like to ask? 
Now, therefore, members, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the business of today's meeting. I'd like to thank everyone for their attendance and input, and I now declare the meeting closed. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.